All right, today we are going to be taking a peek at quadratic inequalities. We've graphed parabolas before, but we're going to work a little bit today on figuring out how to find solutions, or in this case, where we're going to shade to actually turn our inequalities into a solution. So a couple things to notice right off the bat. Uh, number one, should the function's boundary be solid or dashed? That's determined by our inequality arrow. If we have or equal to, it's going to be solid. If we have just greater than or less than, it's going to be dashed to show that difference. Um, how do we graph? That'll change from problem to problem, so we'll take care of those down below. And then where do we shade? Now, there's options here. We can use test points, which we will take a look at on a couple of these to see whether to shade inside or out. But there's also kind of a generalization that we can use with some of these that we're going to talk about. So when we're talking about inside versus outside the curve, when you have one of these where you have your y values are greater than, your y values are greater than as we go upward. So if we go upward and its y is greater than, we're going to shade inside the curve. If our parabola opens downward, that would be cause for us to shade inside the curve when y is less than. And it's just the opposite with my outside. If y is less than and we're opening up, we're going to be outside the curve. And if y is greater than and we open down, we're going to shade outside the curve as well. Okay, but we will talk about test points as well as we go through these. So graph the inequality. If we're in standard form, we need to find a vertex first. So reminder, negative b over 2a is how we find the x value of our vertex. So we take the opposite of b. My b value is the coefficient of x. So the opposite of negative 8 would be 8 over 2 times my a value, my x squared coefficient, which would be 2. So I get an x value of 4. Now to get y, I have options. I can either take this 4 and just plug it in to find y. I think that's the quickest, quickest and simplest method. Or I could type this into my graphing calculator look at the table. Well, I'm not going to do all that work. So plug this in, and I'm like, OK, so 4 squared would be 16. Uh, 8 times 4 is 32 plus 17. Uh, let's see here. 33 minus 32 is 1. So my vertex is at 4, 1. Now where I get my other values here to make the rest of my parabola, we've talked about the pattern that develops about taking my coefficient and saying, okay, it's up 1 and over 1, up 3 and over 1, five and over one. To make my dots, or again, you can use the chart, you can use substitution. You have options. I notice my, my connector is going to be dashed or dotted. And then if I follow my newfound rules, opening up greater than, we're going to shade inside the curve. Now, what if you forget? What if you get confused and you're like, no, I'm not sure? A test point would be a good option for us here. So what we can do is we're going to test a point inside the parabola. So like, let's say, for instance, we choose this point right here. So 4, 3. Doesn't matter which point. I just like using inside the parabola. So I'm going to plug in 3 where y is at. And I'm going to plug in 4 where all my x's are at. and simplify it. So I look at that, I go, well, is 3 greater than 1? Yes. So if I want to use a test point, I, and I get a true statement, I shade inside. If I get a false statement, I shade outside. So we have some options available for you. So let's take another look at one like this. So I take a look at number 2, and I go, OK. Got to find my vertex. Negative b over 2a. My x value is at negative 3. 
So y is going to be negative 3 squared, which is 9, minus 18 plus 4. So my vertex is at negative 3, negative 5. And again, I have an x squared coefficient of 1. So I just go up and over. Now again, if you wanted to, as I plot a few extra dots here, solid line. If you were looking for another option, and again, I like the pattern option better, it's quicker and it makes you think, but if you want to go to a calculator, once you know where your vertex is and you center that up, you would see the symmetry that we have here, and you also would plot the same points that I have here. Your choice. I'm opening up. Y is less than, I'd be shading on the outside. And again, if you don't remember that, our test point is an option. So let's say I decided I was going to test out, what do we got here? Negative 3, 0. So 0 for Y. Negative 3, quantity squared is 9 minus 18 plus 4. Because again, I'm just plugging in the negative 3 wherever the x's are at and then simplifying. So is 0 less than or equal to negative 5? Well, no. False means we shade outside. So again, you have options to kind of see how this works. So what other twists can I throw at you? Because again, graph the parabola, shade it, figure out where the solution is. What if I give you a negative x squared coefficient? Still shouldn't be an issue. Opposite of b. Careful here. Over 2a, 2 times negative 1 is negative 2. So my x value is 2. My y value, again, the 2 is being squared. The negative is not inside the parentheses here. I'm not substituting a negative value. So 2 squared is 4, but then I put the negative on. 4 times 2 is 8. Negative 10 plus 8 is negative 2. So my vertex is at 2, negative 2. And I can still use the pattern to get my other points, except now I'm just going down 1, down 3 and over one. If I want to go down five and over one too, I got the room. Dotted or a dashed line or dashed connector would be a more appropriate way of putting it. And again, opening downward with y being less than means we're going to be shading inside. Or again, I could use my test point. Now, this last one that we're going to do up in this section is number five because it's going to introduce us to something that we're going to be dealing with on the back. Everything we've been doing here is figuring out where is this true for my y values, okay? Where am I going to get true statements for y, for my range? What happens if I get a setup like this? Could I still set it up like standard form? Am I still going to need my vertex? Yes, that absolutely would be helpful here. So if I was going to look as far as that goes, so for my vertex, I'm still going to do negative b over 2 times a. Plug that in to get my y. So negative 1 squared would be 1 times 2 would be 2. 4 times negative 1 is negative 4. So I get a vertex at negative 1, negative 2. Oops, negative 1, negative 2. Hardy, hardy, hardy. But this time, instead of doing a chart or my pattern, I'm going to look and I'm going to go, you know what? 
I'm going to find the x-intercepts. Now this is more of an in an intercept form, which is the reason I'm going to do that. So I factor out anything they have in common. And then I set each of those quantities equal to 0 to find my 2x-intercepts. So if I do 2x equals 0, x plus 2 equals 0, I find my intercepts are at 0 and negative 2. And once I have those three points, that's good. I go ahead, I get that set. We're opening upward, y is greater than, we'll shade in the middle. Okay. But again, if you're more comfortable with a test point, that's okay. Or if you want to use the chart to come up with your values, that's fine. So what other applications would we have with this? Well, write a quadratic inequality for each graph in vertex form. Reminder, vertex form. Looks like this with my vertex at hk. Okay, so what I can find down here on number 7 is, I see my vertex right away. So my vertex is at 3, 0. I also can see right away, in this case, what my a value is. Because I look and I see, ooh, it's up 1 over 1, like my pattern was before. Okay, That'll happen occasionally. That's not going to happen every time, and we'll talk about that in a second. So here, so I've got y. I'm not going to put equals because remember this is inequality. We'll talk about that in a minute. x minus h, because again, h and k. So you're like, okay, well, what do I do now? Well, it opens upward. But I also notice that it's shaded inside when it's opening upward, which is inside the curve which is greater than and since it's a solid line or equal to. And that's it. Again, if you just wrote x minus 3 squared, that would be okay. But that's all I'd do for this one. Now on 8, i got to be careful. Notice, as we're working our way up here, that we're counting by 6's on this scale. Still counting by 1's side to side, though. So my vertex here is at negative 2, positive 36. Okay, so that helps me with some things. But I can't necessarily figure out then what my pattern's going to be. And I can't use this like slope. This isn't an absolute value graph. I know that my a value is going to be negative since it opens down. But how am I going to figure out what that a value is? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to find a point that I know for sure is on this parabola, like this one jumps out at me. So I pick a point. My point here would be 4, 0. <coughs> and here's how I'm going to figure out my a values. So stick with me. If I just went with my vertex part, I'd have y equals, I don't know what my a is yet, x, the opposite of h, opposite of negative 2 is 2 squared plus k. Okay, how do I figure out a? Well, I just got this point, which has an x and a y value. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in the x and the y value from this other point. That I know is on my graph. So I look and I go, okay, so let's see. So we got the 4, 0, 4 in for x, 0 in for y. And I'm going to go ahead. 4 plus 2 is 6. 6 squared is 36a. It's 36. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to solve for a. Now again, if I can see it clearly like I did on 7, you can go ahead and assume. But otherwise, I never want to assume that that's going to be the case. So I got my a value. And now I can get my equation in vertex form. 
oops, not equals hardy. Well, I'll just put it as equals for now and then we'll fix it here. So again, I see it's opening down. I see it's a solid line, so it's going to be our equal to. And it's inside. So I see it would be y is then or equal to negative 1, 2 squared plus 36. Okay. You run into these rarely in this form, but you may have to do that sometimes. So just something you want to watch out for. All right, to the back. Now, here's what I want you to notice. You're like, ooh, we're still just solving, so I'm going to keep using the pattern. Something's changed here that you need to be aware of. Notice it's not y anymore on this side, okay? Here before, I was looking for values that would cover my range. Not the case anymore when I come over here. When I come over here, I'm using this value to tell me where the function is above or below the x-axis. And then we're going to be looking for domain values because we're going to find interval notation. So here's how this is going to work. I still want to graph them. I don't necessarily have to shade though. So let's, let's chat here. So when we're back here, one of my big things is I need to find my x-intercepts. In other words, I need to factor my quadratic, set each of those equal to zero, to get my intercepts because that's going to help me do my interval notation. And once I do that, I still need to find my vertex though. So again, to find my vertex, I could count in, but I like doing things you can do for every problem. You're going to add your x values and divide by 2. That's going to give you the x value of your vertex. And then to get y, we just plug it back in. 3 squared is 9. 6 times 3 is 18. Uh, negative 4. So my vertex is at 3, negative 4. I get that in. Now, like I said before, I don't have to shade here because what I'm looking for is where the function is above or below the x-axis. If my y values are less than, it's going to be below. So what I'm looking for is how to signify this area. How can I write this area in interval notation, which again is left to write x values. What's my furthest x value to the left? What's well, this x-intercept right here at 1? And again, I'm using the parentheses because it's not our equal to. So I follow it around here to the right till I get over here to 5, my other x-intercept. And I close it off. You're like, hey, this is kind of like an and statement before where we just had this, but it absolutely is. We're just looking at it on this type of a graph, a grid graph instead of a line graph, which we're also going to look at the line graph here momentarily. So then 10, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to factor this out. I'm going to set each of these equal to 0 and solve them. But my vertex is going to get a little nastier this time. Because when I add negative 1 half and 3, and again if you're going to a calculator use parentheses or this is going to get bad in a hurry. 2 and a half would be 1.25. Yee, this is going to get ugly calculator up here to help us out. So again, all I'm going to do is I'm going to plug that 1.25 in for my x's. Because that will help me find my y value. Okay. 
Yee, more ugliness. So my vertex is an ever lovely 1.25, negative 6.125. Solid. But like I drew up on my screen a little bit here before we got to that part, greater than zero is going to be above the x-axis. So I want these values, and I want these values. You're like, well, wait a minute, though. If it's left to right, this is going to keep going and going and going and going and going and going and going forever to the left. That's true, off to negative infinity. And that's going to come in until I get to, guess what, this x-intercept, negative 1 half. And then there's nothing, 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 oops, starting again at my other x-intercept, 3, and going forever to the right. Oh, it's like an OR statement was. Right, now we're starting to make some connections here. So as I do this, I'm like, okay, so for graphs, I use the less than zero or the greater than zero to figure out which part below the x-axis, above the x-axis, so I can figure out my interval notation or my domain. When I go to do it algebraically, I'm doing the same thing. I'm still factoring to find zeros. Now here's where life changes. Okay, there are three portions on my graph since I have these two x-intercepts that I use. These two zeros is the more proper term. And I like to call this section A, section B, and section C. Here's how this is going to work. You're going to find your solution set either in session, section B or in A and C. Well, how do I know? A couple ways I can do this. The easiest way is by recognizing the fact that at greater than, this is an OR statement. If you remember our OR statements from before, those are the ones that had graphs that went out like this. If I remember that, I can just go ahead put them out and work about my business. But let's say I forget. We can do a test point to figure this out. I always test a point in section B because if it's true, it's going to be in here. If it's false, it's going to be out in A and C. So let's say, for instance, we pick a number between negative 2 and 4. 0. Nice. I plug in 0 for x. Is negative 8 greater than 0? No. So our answer isn't in B. Our answers are in A and C. With a parenthesis because we don't have the R equal to. And then it's old school interval notation. Left to right. Left is at negative infinity to my intercept. Excuse me, to my zero. I'm going to get that right, Hardy. And start up again at my other zero and go to infinity, and I'm good. So that's how these are going to work. But again, if you recognize the or, or for our next one, the and statement, which basically was just what's in the middle, that will save you some time. So I find my x-intercepts. Somebody should be yelling at me at this point. Hardy, it's zero. Oh, yeah. That's true. And again, I could separate this into sections A, B, and C and test a number in B. But I recognize that it's an and statement. Well, what if I forget it's an and statement? Okay, okay. We'll test the value out. How about negative one? Negative 1 squared is 1 times 3 is 3, minus 7 plus 2. Let's see, 5 minus 7 is negative 2 less than or equal to 0. That's true. So we shade section B, which is what we did anyway. 
And then my interval notation is just my left zero, negative two, to my right, and I'm set. You're like, okay, so that's kind of just like some review stuff, except we're doing it with an inequality, that's true. There is one thing that can go haywire though. Great, there's always gotta be something that goes haywire. Yeah, it's true. We're gonna go down to number 15 for a minute. Personally, I never like dealing with a negative x squared term when I'm trying to factor it. It just makes things hard. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna divide everything by negative one. That's gonna take care of my negative x squared, but it also changes the signs on my other terms. But what else does dividing by a negative do? Yeah, it flips my arrow around. So I can just work it this way now. So I'm like, okay. So solve it algebraically. All right, let's do my factoring here. Multiply to 15 and add to negative two. Wait a minute. Two negatives or two positives. This isn't gonna work. Well, now what do I do? Can I just say no solution, I'm done? No, we have another weapon. Factoring doesn't work. What is our Swiss army knife of solving quadratics? I just gave you a hint with the last word. The quadratic formula, ladies and gentlemen. So again, I look at this and I go, okay, I got my A, I got my B, I got my C. Opposite of B, plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. Let's knock this out. So 4 minus 60, hmm. Okay, Hardy, here's a new one for you. What, I can just pop an eye out. No, not in this case. Because remember, if we're writing an interval notation, we need to be able to graph it or put it on a number line. I can't do either of those things with an imaginary number. So I just say no reals and go on with my life. Okay, that's the only time we can get away with not having some interval notation of some sort. So you've got your assignment there to work on. Again, we'll have an opportunity to talk about this together tomorrow. For having some issues and start heading down the home stretch towards our unit exam.